we uh, we noticed about a hundred birds singing as we walked down the hill this morning. You would think it would be springtime to them. I'm sure they're very confused. But Terry said actually they were alive and well at 5 a.m. I did not hear them at 5 a.m. But uh, if you study the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a line by line uh, acknowledgement of things that happen to us as we get older. And one of them is we hear the early morning sounds. And uh, so Terry's getting older, I'm not. She's hearing the early morning sounds. We, um, we need to do due diligence to the wrath of God. And it just seems like a time in class, not wanting to get ahead in Romans and to study in our sermons in an appropriate order. But uh, I was made aware a number of years ago, Jonathan Edwards, on July the 8th, 1741, preached at that time, and the fact that it's still acknowledged, what was a very unusual, well-received, and somewhat uh, dramatic sermon, topic was sinners in the hands of an angry God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that's Romans 1, verse 18. Sinners, willful sinners, who have rationally decided that God is not going to be part of their life, and the wrath of God is stored up against those who refuse to retain the truth about God. And so uh, it's a study that needs to come in to our awareness, I think. And it needs to come in the way Paul presents it, uh, especially Romans 1 verse 16 about the gospel, and Romans 2 and 3 as he's finishing out that section. I remember as a young person hearing people make the observation that God in the Old Testament was a God of wrath, and he was a God of love in the New Testament. Now, that didn't make sense to me when I heard it, and it's certainly not true. Both circumstances, Old and New Testament, we see comments, actions, <coughs> directions by God. And I saw a point actually this morning as I was just looking over some notes. God's wrath is not against the sinner. And when I read my notes, it's in these notes for class, it caught my attention, and I stopped there for a moment. We've said most of our lives, haven't we, that we love the sinner but hate the sin? And by loving the sinner, we're trying to do that which will help us to bring them into the kingdom. But that concept works when God, his wrath is against the sin and not the sinner. His wrath is against the unrighteousness acts of the sinner. But it's the sinner who brings those to bear. So it's not ignoring the human part of it. But God's wrath is really more against the uh, unrighteousness, the unrighteous acts. And then toward the very end of my notes, and I made a point to myself, be sure and say this early in class, because it sums up what we're saying this morning. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. And it tells us that God will deal out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that puts Romans 1 and 2 in an exact statement. Retribution for those who do not know God, and of course, it's those who choose not to retain that truth about God, 2 Thessalonians 1 8, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing God would open the door to understanding that he sent his monogenes, his only begotten, 
to earth, the incarnate. Uh, so that verse is a verse that speaks to everything that we will be saying today in other terms. Uh, modern seeker religious groups today don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about unrighteousness and God's retribution against it. Uh, they're more in tune to bringing people in and letting them feel good about where they are, spiritually speaking, and uh, never giving them the diagnosis of the disease that could send them to eternal damnation, as we would bring two metaphors together. Uh, we've said this before, I want to go to a doctor that's going to tell me what's wrong and how to fix it. That's the kind of religion, if you will, and I don't even like that word because it's usually rote, uh, it's not inward as much, uh, but Christianity, I, I want Christianity to tell me where I stand before God and then when I have confidence to make certain that I have that confidence. And we're talking tonight about Satan as the accuser and because we used that metaphor in one of the first sermons I preached here in August, we're going to spend more time looking at guilt. Good guilt, bad guilt, uh, how do we recognize it and that type of thing as we continue our spiritual warfare study this evening. But they don't want to hear about it. Uh, I read something, a God without wrath brought men without sin, into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. You cannot divorce God and Christ and the cross and all that in between. Um, and some would question the approach of the seeker religious groups. And when you start reading the book of Romans, they would say, Paul, what are you doing? You're giving them the bad news too quickly. Now he talks of the gospel, it's the good news, but he very quickly spends two chapters, two and a half chapters, talking about unrighteousness. And yet Paul got it exactly right. Uh, they need to both be there, they need to uh, present a balance, and as those who analyze the book of Romans, we saw the good news, and now he's telling us the bad news. There's good news and bad news in this message, Ron. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that term seeker. You use it twice. Would, would you? Uh, well, where, where did you get it from? And, what, and that, I think I know what it means, but would you? Well, the seeker religious groups are those who are just seeking to bring people in, and they're not teaching them sin. Uh, they want numbers. Uh, the Lakeview Church in Houston is the best example. 45,000 people, six services, and they brag about not studying sin, hell. They, it's a health and wealth presentation. Uh, so they're seeking people, but not giving them what they need to hear. Gary, is yeah. that what we sometimes call a feel-good church? It, it would be that feel-good church. In some regards, a charismatic church that deals with the emotion right. more than the intellect, uh, right. more the information that could transform their life. Um, but we need the bad news because it's real and it's part of God's message. He's going to bring retribution against those who know not God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it can't be said any clearer. When you know? I was growing up, we heard a lot of fire, hell, and brimstone from the pulpit, a lot. Yes. And now you hardly ever hear anything about that. Uh, hopefully it's presented in a mixture of message, and so it doesn't maybe light, light us up quite as much. Uh, my brother did some graduate work in Austin. The morning preacher was fire and brimstone. The Sunday evening preacher was love and tenderness and God. Every Sunday he got, he got each of them. And I won't mention names, but some of you would be aware of who they were. Um, it was a little both. 
and probably they made sure that they presided the other side of the coin, presented the other side of the coin, because the other maybe was, was more steady. We need both. We need both. Um, Terry? As long as everybody comes and gets the full menu, if you come just one time, you don't get the full menu yeah. of yeah. what's being presented. That's well, they would want to hear Tony at night, for sure. Roll Evans and Tony Ash, the two Texas ministers, hell and heaven. Uh, and that was his observation. They probably wouldn't have seen it that way. Uh, I'm sure they thought they had a good balance, but that's the way he perceived it. Um, if we're going to understand why we need God's power in the gospel, and why we need his very righteousness imputed to our account, then we need to understand his wrath against our sin. They go hand in hand, and that's where we're headed today. Um, when you think of the word wrath and apply it to God, do you hear or see in your mind someone standing up yelling, his face is red, and he's engaged in a lot of movement, and it's just, is that what you no. see in your mind? In your mind? Mostly examples I've ever seen in the Bible, like when he told them not to do something, just as soon as they did it, hey, they were taken. Yeah. But how do we, how do we see wrath? Like a parent. Child. Yeah, uh, and, and it's not it's not anger, uh, if you will. It's not hitting. Uh, it's acting out in an appropriate way to someone's actions. Um, when Eric and them were preparing to adopt Sheldon, they had to write a fairly extensive pay a report on his life growing up. And it was four or five pages, and he texted it to me. They were in China, and he texted it to me. He said, Dad, read this. I don't mind if you read it, but then print it and send it to this address. And so I put it on my computer, opened it on my computer, and read it. And I saw something, and I kind of chuckled to myself. And I said, Terry, Terry, come here, come here. What, what's wrong? What do you want? What? Listen to this. And Eric described growing up in a home where he does not remember his mom and dad ever yelling. And I thought, that's not true, but I'm glad he thinks that. <laughs> I'm sure we did, but not yelling endlessly at the top of our voice and lasting for minutes. It was probably, be quiet, I'm trying to take a nap down the hall, that type of thing. But we were happy that he didn't remember the times that we must have yelled. Uh, at least it could have been taken as yelling, if you will. But the bottom line, we, we see it differently if we don't see it in the way that we would see God. And we'll talk about it in our sermon this morning as well. Um, we need to get rid of human notions of someone with a bad temper who flies off the handle at the least provocation, just the least thing. Uh, I remember Bertina Faulkner in their marriage seminar. Paul Faulkner would do the presentation and he was making the point that we need to communicate with each other. We need to deal with emotions when they occur and he was up there while he was talking and he had a small box of Kleenex and he was taking the Kleenex out at one point you know we have these problems and he pulled out some Kleenex as he was talking and then as he continued talking he started stuffing them back in the box and he says that's not healthy you need to deal with the emotions as they occur. If you just ignore them or stuff them in, hold them in, at some point the slightest little thing is going to finally upset you. And you're just going to blow your mind. And all of it comes out. And you'll look at that person and say, 
why are you so upset that I dropped a pencil on the floor and didn't pick it up? You know, something minute. But you've been stuffing all these things away instead of dealing with them. And um, that's what happens when we don't deal with those things and we have that small event and a huge blow up of all of it coming out. Uh, but that's not God. That's not God. And if his settled, determined, active opposition, it's to sin. It's a settled, determined, active opposition to all sin. And if God loves righteousness, he also must hate evil. And there's the balance. Why does he hate sin so much? Because it's not him. It's not his nature. It's not what he wants for us, and he's provided something to take care of that sin. And of course, that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and our bringing that into our life in a final act of immersion in water. Uh, but if God were all love and no wrath, he would not be God. Uh, the writers make examples helping us to understand it. Uh, think of going before a judge who was all wrath and no love, or all love and no wrath. You go to a court of law, you want balance. You want there to be judgment measured with patience, with mercy, if you will. But all love or all wrath is not God. And for us to think differently, it's not fair to him. Um, I'm going to read some verses. You can turn there. I'll, if I see you turning, I'll slow down. But if you want to just listen, they're just quick, short verses that use a word over and over again. And they're in the New Testament. Uh, John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And that's not the correct quotation of that. In the midst of those words, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Perish is part of the New Testament. There's a point of not responding to the love of God through Christ, and there's a perishing thing attached to it. Ephesians 2, verse 3. We looked at that many weeks ago now. Jew and Gentile were children of wrath. It's a Jewish way of saying that we're characterized by being under God's wrath. Those outside of Christ are children of wrath. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, Jesus rescues us from the wrath to come. Perish, wrath, they're not new principles that just came up in Romans 1, verse 18. We read 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8 and 9, our retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, J.I. Packer, in his book, Knowing God, made this statement. One of the most striking things about the Bible is the vigor with which testaments emphasize the reality and the terror of God's wrath. It's real. It's real. And A.W. Pink, Attributes of God, a study of the concordance will show that there are more references in Scripture to his anger and fury and wrath than there are to his love and tenderness. Now, the overriding message of the New Testament is Christ. So it's not like it's void, the love and patience of God displayed through his Son, but the actual words are numerous. Terry? I was thinking, uh, the incidents when I can remember, like it started in the garden. He tells the instructions, but he tells the consequences right there up front. Yeah. And so then when people go against that, that's when his wrath comes. Mm -hmm. But he gives instructions and clear. Yeah. And he's telling the truth. 
he's been candid, transparent, and realistic uh, in each of those. Uh, look at the Bible. We studied Noah Wednesday in the men's class. We're studying the Shunammite woman, ladies, as you join us Wednesday night in our encounters of God. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, warning them, negotiating, trying to how many righteous souls might be in there so it can be spared. Uh, Noah, the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Judah and Israel, uh, Israel, IJ, north, south, the kingdoms or the divisions of the children of Israel were covered up in history with times that God allowed heathen nations to win victories over them when they were not faithful, when they were rebellious. And it was not as if on a weekend they acted up and they were uh, allowed to take, be taken into bondage on a Monday morning. Many, many, many years. And the life of Israel and Judah was ebb and flow. But God was consistent to give them opportunity and then to bring about judgment. Uh, it's part of the picture, if you will, of God and Scripture. Um, we do a series, um, Statements of Jesus on the Cross. All of them have a deep message attached to them. I don't know what it must have been like to be Mary seeing her son on the cross and Jesus seeing Mary and giving the charge of the care of his mother to John. And that's a great moment and message, if you will. But what about the loud utterance, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If, if God and unrighteousness in dealing with sin does not get our attention when that was stated, and of course, just around the corner, metaphorically, today you will be with me in paradise to the thief on the cross who showed some belief and understanding. We're guilty, he's not. Today he'll be with me in paradise. So again, both sides of the coin represented there. Now, why did God forsake Christ on the cross? Three hours. Sin. God cannot fellowship sin. And what did that three hours of darkness in the middle of the day signify? Jesus taking upon himself as the sacrifice or the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. He became a sin offering, but he became sin. The personification of what sin would be represented as he took it on and then laid it away, if you will, by offering that once for all sacrifice. Um, it's real. It's real. And we will finish class and we will finish the sermon this morning. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, which is the final act of the immediate belief in the death, burial, of Jesus, uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, immersion in water to deal with your sins, why not? Why not today? What's holding you back? Scripture is clear for the need. And his terrible death shows that God cannot just brush our sin aside. And uh, that's a statement that has some humanity to it. Um, oh, it's not that bad. You know, and we usually, when we say something like that, we'll just kind of make a brush it aside signal with our hands, if you will. It's not that bad. He doesn't just brush our sin aside. And Scripture is clear about it. Um, I found an article. I've seen it before, and I appreciated that it was on the Internet. Um, how does God reveal His wrath? 
The first way he deals with that wrath is the universal reality of the human death, of death. What was his design for Adam and Eve in the garden? Life. To reach up and eat of that tree, we think it was an apple, gala, Fuji, we don't know. It's depicted that way, but to eat from that tree and live forever. And he, God placed the cherubim at the entrance to the garden so that they could not re-enter and perhaps reach up and eat and live forever. They were kicked out of the garden and the tree was prohibited. <laughs> The human death is one of the displays of God's actions toward their sin. And of course they began to die physically immediately with the idea that they would not otherwise. Now God knew they would sin and he had in his mind before the creation that he would provide a sacrifice and bring into existence a spiritual kingdom. Ephesians 1 talks about that predetermination of God. Um, but they were there enjoying time with God and had no shame. And uh, it's just the reality. Death is the judgment of God on the ungodliness and unrighteousness of the human race. Um, the second one um, it's a word I don't know that we use that often, universal, universal futility and misery are the result of God's wrath. Uh, Romans 8, verse 18 and verse 20 talk about it. I'll let you turn there. We've looked at those verses briefly, and as we get through Romans, we're going to really slow down and see the message of Romans 8 because it's a climactic occasion to the other chapters leading up to it. Romans 8 verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Now, I think that's talking about the earth and the work that Adam had to begin after sin that involved sweat. Tending a garden is very different than working a garden. And so it's talking about the physical earth also, but it's acknowledging the difficulties that we as humans go through on earth. And the statement being made in that three sections of sentence is it will be worth it. The glory above will be worth it. Whatever we go through, it will be worth it. Understand that and maintain and be faithful. It will be worth it. And uh, Paul makes that point several times in several ways. And look at Romans 8 verse 20. The word is used in different translations. The creation was re subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And that's an older translation, but again, the futility of life. And the other side of the coin, of course, is what God makes possible for us. Neither Satan nor Adam in the Garden of Eden was planning for the hope of the human race. They simply sinned. But God showed his wrath against sin and subjected creation to futility, not as the last word, but in hope. There would come a day when the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Genesis 3.15, the first messianic proclamation in the Bible. But the misery and futility of the world we live in is, is owing to God subjecting creation to futility 
and is a testimony to his wrath against sin. And again, against sin, not the sinner. It's our actions that he will be acting against, judging us for. Now, we are responsible for our actions. We're not removing that. But it's just the reality of what he's saying. Um, because we will run out of time, we have time here to turn to Romans 2 and make some preliminary statements. We won't have the time in the sermon. I wasn't certain I would head that way, but we can. <clears throat> Romans 2, verse 4. It's a very intriguing statement. It's a statement made to a Jewish Christian who says, I'm not as bad as those guys in chapter 1. And I have to repeat that in the sermon. But he said, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? I think of a substitute teacher when I see that verse. It's the worst job in America, I think. Uh, they know you're a substitute. Not a lot of planning has gone into that day or week, perhaps, because you weren't planning to be there. And the teacher made provisions, but it's not the same. And someone who goes in and is kind, let's use these words, kind and tolerant and patient, what do many students think they can do in that circumstance. <laughs> I heard several words. Right? Take, take advantage. Take advantage, Gary. That's what I said. Okay. Walk, Walk all over you. No, God. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it's just the opposite of what you would think. Your kindness provokes them to think that they could just walk all over you. Instead of you being reciprocal in your actions, well, she or he is, is so patient and kind, and, and I'm going to be nice today. It's against my nature. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to be nice today. It doesn't work that way most of the time. We take advantage of someone's kindness and patience and tolerance. And Paul acknowledges that, talking to the Jewish Christians. And uh, it ought to be very different than that. It ought to be one that leads us toward repentance. Now, 2 Peter 3 talks about the patience of God, and it makes the analogy that a day is as a thousand years, and God doesn't want anyone to uh, perish, there you go, to, but to come to repentance. And he's patient and kind and tolerance to give us time. But what's the reality eventually? Run out of time. We're going to run out of time. We're going to run out of time. Two events have struck me in that regard over the years. One on a Wednesday night at the Brainerd Church of Christ, I was an associate minister. Wednesday night, Ernest Cleveringer led the closing prayer, and we were at his funeral on Saturday morning in that same building. Wow. And that's when it really strikes you for different reasons. It needed to, the, the funeral was scheduled fairly quickly. Another story. Uh, Sunday night after a Thanksgiving, 1992, I think it was. Uh, Mom and Dad had a group into their home. They had a great time of fellowship, sent them out the door, and at 1.15 Monday, my dad passed. His funeral was Wednesday morning. 
because of the quickness of it, some came to the service on Wednesday at the congregation where he'd been an elder for 31 years and had been away from news sources or out of town and had not realized that dad had passed. But it gets your attention, doesn't it? We can't know when our time ends. We don't know. And I make the statement fairly often, we are closer now to our judgment day than we were one minute ago. And when we pass, we are moments away from judgment day because we no longer are living in a time sphere. We've entered into eternity, if you will. It's right there. From our study of Cain and Abel, sin is crouching at the door. It longs to have you, but you must master it. It's just right there. And the wrath of God is not against the person, first and foremost. Though each person bears accountability for their actions, but it's against the sin and the provisions God provides are against the sin to wipe it away, to, to make it disappear. The wrath is against our actions, but we must account for those actions. So uh, it's, it's a balance. I think it's a good balance, and I just felt like we probably should give it some time this morning. Your observations, I finish what I have to say. I'll glance over my notes while you offer comments if you would like. Gary, it makes me yes, think like a principle we've all heard growing up in school when you're, you're cause and effect. And you have to know the votes because God wants us to choose always. Yes. And so you can't choose up to know only the good if you don't recognize what the other side is. Absolutely. And so that's how he designed us. That's how he created the world. And, you know, that's the reason why I'm not going to do I agree completely. The, the balance, the two sides, but one without the other is, is not God. It's not the true picture of God, if you will. Other comments? Every action has a reaction. Yeah. Do, yeah, yeah. Uh, and people watching, people watching, uh, the internet and different places on the internet are, are real good about reminding us that it's not what we say, but it's what they see first. Uh, what we say is usually not accepted if they don't see it. Your words don't have the same effect if the actions aren't behind it. And, and that's not suggesting that our children thought we would be perfect or that we could be perfect. But they need to see fair and balanced. They need to hear us admit wrong. I'm sorry. I messed up. My bad. Our children need to, to know that. To know that we don't see ourselves as never messing up. But at the same point, we would hope to teach them to do the same thing. I'm sorry, I messed up. I'll try to do better, Mom. It's the greatest words a parent can hear from a child at whatever age they are. Uh, accountability for actions. Um, did you think God was a God of wrath in the Old Testament compared to love in the New Growing up, it seems that way. It's been the same because, because whenever he said something, you didn't do it. You died. Yeah, yeah. The Old Testament certainly had quick actions attached to it. No question. New Testament's got it too. Oh yeah. Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. In about a month, we're going to let Ananias and Sapphira. We're going to do it next month when the ladies are. Actually, I'll be gone, but the next time the ladies are with us on Wednesday night, we're going to look at the act of hypocrisy in the actions of Ananias and Sapphira, those encounters with God. Um, it was immediate. He gave them a chance. 
He gave them a chance to fess up, but they lied to the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about why it was so immediate there. There's a definite reasoning behind it. Other reflections, thank you for your comments. One thing is about time to me, I've always thought about it, you know, a thousand years is a day, a day is a thousand years. There's no time. God is eternal. He's always there forever and ever and ever. And here we are living in a time concept. And I think our minds, we relate to time. I think about when I was born. I had no concept before then. So when I die, I always just feel this. This is just me talking. Sure, sure. That it's going to be immediate. Everything's going to be immediate because there's no time. Yeah. Why are we waiting? I mean, it would it makes sense when you think of a big picture and it's kind of out of our realm as God thinking, okay, well, they're there in the time element, but we're eternal. We're in a, it's a different situation. And so I feel like everything is going to be immediate when we pass away. Yeah. So, If it weren't for the rich man in Lazarus, a uh, place of paradise, uh, Abraham's bosom, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a place without time. But it does involve, quote, waiting in eternity, which is an oxymoron. But yeah, that's one of our encounters too, probably, the rich man. Uh, well, as far as the waiting, how do you feel about the Hades thing? You know, I mean, it's not where we immediately would be there, and the river dividing, and then. Yeah. Yeah, you certainly. We are looking at the people in anguish over there. I call it a shadow or a prejudgment, waiting for the final judgment. Uh, just for lack of a better word to explain that, that story. Uh, and there's things in it that I'm not certain we know. Even the great scholars aren't certain, I don't think. It's something to think about. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Uh, what I would say now, as it applies to what we're doing here, what did the rich man say and want when he was in that eternal place where there's weeping and gnashing. They wanted some water, they wanted somebody to pour his throat. That's yeah, right. I don't want my brothers to come here. So he understood the consequences and he understood others would join him if they did not make changes. Now, we've got to see that message and that may be the main reason it's there. Uh, those who die and aren't they don't know God or haven't obeyed the gospel, they're going to wish others on earth would do that, that they would become members of the body of Christ in our circumstances. Baptism wasn't a part of the element uh, when he was telling that story in the gospels. They don't want you to be where they are. No question about that message. Um, but anyway, other comments. Your, the best comments are after I finished. <laughs> Application question. I'll give you two minutes. I may take it during the sermon. Thank you.